that out. So welcome everyone and today is day three out of three for three webinars in a row that I've been running and some of you have been to all three so thank you so much for doing that if you have done that. Um, that's many hours of hearing me talk so <laughs> well done. If I don't know you already, my name is Katie and I run my business Midnight Music. I spend my time training teachers, specifically music teachers, in how to use technology in the classroom. So I do that through workshops and online training particularly. I have my website, which is Midnight Music. I have a podcast called the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. And I have a couple of boys that you can see there on the screen and a dog named Ella. So before we get started, a few housekeeping things. If you do have tech issues, it's almost always to do with the internet at your own end. So just refresh the browser or come back into the, the whole thing, you know, just sort of um, come back to the link. You can log into the chat window if you haven't already, and it will max out when we reach 500 people in the chat window. I have a feeling it may get there today, and it did on Monday, I think, and last Friday around another one too. So don't worry if you don't get logged into the chat window. It's it's not the end of the world. You can still watch the video. You can watch the training. And at some point, people will start to drop off out of the chat window as they have to go off and do other things. So there will be a chance to get in there if you need to. So that, that will be the way that you can comment and ask questions uh, during the session and at the end during the Q&A. Now, today, helping me out, as he has been doing for the last two days as well, is Martin Emo, who is based in New Zealand, and he is going to keep an eye on the chat window through the session while I'm presenting. It's easier for me just to plough on and keep going, uh, especially when there's this many people online, and I will join you at the end and answer any questions or get involved with the discussion at that point, but Martin will answer a lot of stuff along the way. And if you know the answer to someone else's question, feel free to chime in and, and offer your assistance too. A copy of the slides that I'm showing are going to be provided to you and that will be within 24 hours or so. We have a, a page that we will set up where the replay of this session will live and there will be a link there for the slides to be downloaded and also a link to where you can get the PD certificate if you'd like to get one for this time. Um, just saying that so that you can take notes, obviously, during the session, but you will also get a copy of the slides. Um, sometimes I, I don't like to put a lot of text on my slides, but I have been doing that for these webinars because these are also the notes from the session, if you know what I mean. And I mentioned we'll do the bigger Q&A at the end of the session too. If you do need to leave, don't worry too much because the session is being recorded and you can catch up on it later on. And I've mentioned that we'll send out the link to the replay page around 24 hours after the session takes place. And I will just mention that this is, um, there's a free training that I do every single month and it's around the middle of the month or so. These ones this week are extra bonus ones because of everything that's going on. And so next week on the, well, 14th or 15th, I think it is of April, depending on which part of the world you're in, uh, there will be the regular monthly training session. And I had not decided what that topic would be until Monday when everybody in the session there basically voted it to be a Flipgrid session. So next week I'll be running a Flipgrid webinar. And although originally that session was going to be in the evening Melbourne time, uh, for me, it's I'm actually going to do it at this time of day again. So if you're in Victoria and you're going back to school on Tuesday or Wednesday next week and you can't make it to that, don't worry because it will be recorded. For the rest of the world, uh, it's not a bad time of day. So, um, But it is being recorded. So that will be great. Okay. So... If you have been watching the other webinars, you will see some repeat slides and I've been saying particularly this first bit in all of the webinars that I've been running at this time, the first thing to think of is to not panic in this situation. So I know a lot of people are really stressed out about the whole online learning thing. It's new and it's different and even for me who's tech savvy, it's still weird and different and new. Uh, in some regards, uh, particularly when I'm thinking about running choir rehearsals in an online format, it is new and different. But don't panic. 
the main things to remember are that your superpowers are that you know your own content, you know how to teach, and you're awesome at it. So just bear that in mind and, you know, take comfort in those things because they are all true. Today's session, I'm going to talk about the main tech tools that you'll need for teaching remotely or online teaching. I really want to talk about asynchronous teaching and learning as a focus. I'm going to talk about content, your own content, teaching materials and how you can create those and deliver them in an online format. And I want to get stuck into some lesson and activity ideas as well. So when teaching online, the most important things to think of are that there are only two things you really need to do this online teaching. And the first thing is that you have your content which is your lesson materials and your resources and so on. And you need some way of delivering those to your students. So that's where the technology part comes in. Now, you do need to rethink things somewhat. You need to think about your lessons that you have been doing live in person in your classroom. And you need to just accept the fact that you cannot translate those exactly into an online format. I think that's what a lot of people think they're going to do at first is I'm going to get the kids to log in at 10 a.m. I'm going to run my normal music lesson. It's just that we'll be in an online format. It's not going to happen like that. Even if your school is thinking that it might, <laughs> by the time you all try that, I can tell you now they're going to shift very quickly and it's not going to happen. So you sort of need to let that go and be open and adaptable and flexible to other options. You also need to consider the challenges that students are facing at home. And I've said this in all of the webinars, uh, some students are not gonna be able to log on at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday because there might be one device in their household only and they are sharing it with three siblings and two parents. Or they may have no internet access or very little internet access or terrible bandwidth because there are five people in their house trying to be online at the same time. So all of those things are difficulties. Um, if you've got very young students, and that is particularly today's group of teachers, you know, if you've got young students, they may need to have an adult present if you're going online with them at a live synchronous time because the adult's going to need to help them and be present in that session. And the adult may actually need to work at that time that you're planning. So just need to think about other options. Also, um, the consistent theme that I'm hearing from people who have started online teaching is that, is that you need to dial things way back. Like whatever you're planning right now, cut it in half and maybe that will work. Maybe you'll need to dial it back even further. So uh, again, we'll talk a little bit about that. So um, from your own point of view, from a personal point of view, I think it's best to start with the basic and easy tech options for you yourself. So start off with things that you already know how to use or maybe that you need to use because your school is saying that you need to use them. I, I really think this is not the time to learn three new software applications. It's just not the time for that. If you already know all the other things and you are like reveling in this time at home and you've got time to learn new stuff and you really like doing that, by all means, go for it. But if you're in that position where you're a little bit worried, you're already stressed about some of the things you need to do and even can't imagine how your classes are going to work, this is maybe not the time to take on too many new things. Really important to focus on the music and learning outcomes. And I don't have it on this slide, but even more than that, connecting with the students and allowing them to connect with each other is really important at this time because they are not getting that clearly in person from you. Keeping things really simple also is a good thing to remember. So let's just talk about the basics of but the, the tech things, first of all, so the tech essentials that you're going to use to deliver online learning. So the first thing is, and, and these are not really in any order of importance, but the first thing is a learning management system. Now, this is going to be most of the time prescribed by the school for you. So an example of a learning management system, and this is the place, it's like your learning home, the place where you'll store materials and communicate with students. This is things like Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, 
Seesaw. I know a lot of you are using Seesaw, which is particularly popular and really useful for younger students. Uh, you might be using Blackboard or Canvas. There are many, many options here. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in any, any of those today. I've actually spoken a little bit about these sort of basic tech tools in a previous session. So I won't cover a lot of them today, but that's what I'm referring to with learning management system. The second thing that you'll need um, from time to time is a live video conferencing tool. And you may or may not use one of those at all. You may use it intermittently and you may use it frequently. So there are different ways to use your live video conferencing tool. Now, if you're in Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams, they have their own inbuilt options being Google Meet and the Microsoft Teams live video thing, whatever it's called. I can't remember if it's got a name. Um, Zoom is another example of that. And again, there are other options in that category too. The th uh, third thing is your presentation or graphic design software, which may or may not be one and the same thing. And, and by this, I'm referring to things like PowerPoint, Keynote, Google Slides or Canva. They're the, probably the four main ones. You're going to find these, these ones indispensable at this time for putting together your learning materials. And the last thing, and I think this is, if there's one thing new you're going to learn at this time, is how to make your own teaching videos. They don't need to be complex. It can just be you talking at the camera and that's totally fine. But this is such a great skill to learn and so super useful. And if you learn it now, you're going to use it forever more in your teaching career, I can tell you now. So that is the one that I think you should concentrate on if you've got the other things sorted as well. So video recording software, I'm going to go into much more detail about that later on. So I won't list all the options here, but you, you just need something that's going to allow you to record videos and share them with your students. Let's just talk briefly about this asynchronous versus synchronous learning or teaching. Synchronous is where, you know, this is where I think people start out by thinking, I'm going to have my kids log on at 10 a.m. on Tuesday because that's their class time and we're going to run a 40-minute class like I normally do. It's just that we'll all be online. Now, I, I can tell you now it's not going to happen like that. It, it really won't. There's many issues and, and reasons why it's not going to work in that way. You may still do some synchronous sessions though, and I think that these are really good and really important for connection. So synchronous um, live video conferencing calls are probably best used for check-ins or clarification with students or an opportunity for them to ask questions of you if they want to. They might just want to chat to you and, I don't know, tell you what's going on at their house or introduce their pet to you. They may want to talk to each other in that way if it's a system where you can have multiple kids on at once. The asynchronous options of, of working offer much more flexibility and are much more useful to you and to the students in this online learning situation. So I really think that's where the emphasis needs to lie is in the asynchronous options. So that, how does that look? You might be sort of thinking, well, how does that look? So with asynchronous teaching and learning, you as a teacher are going to prepare materials ahead of time which might be videos or handouts or digital resources of some sort, like a Google Slides presentation, which you give to them in a digital format or some other kind of presentation. There, there might be other materials that you share with students and it could be a combination of all of these or just one of these things. And you're going to share them somewhere. You're going to upload them and share them somewhere. So if you're using a learning management system, Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, this is where you would share that material. Now, the students can then access that material when they have access to a device, when they have access to the internet, and they're going to check the task, the assignment, do the assignment, hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed, we might talk a bit more about that later, do the assignment and then submit something to you if that's what you require. Now, in terms of feedback, again, you can provide feedback when it's convenient for you. And, you. and like I mentioned before, you might save that live video conference session for a Q&A or a discussion about what you've done or if um, students just need to check up on something with you. This works really well because it's so much more flexible and it just means that um, everyone can do the work when they are able to do it. 
So tips for asynchronous teaching, um, it's really good to provide offline and online options for activities. So you don't always want to be assigning things that require a website or an app or some sort of software because, again, some of those students may not have access to it. And I actually know, I've, I've seen discussion in many Facebook groups about the fact that uh, some of you are not allowed to provide activities that are only able to be completed with technology. You have to provide a balance or you have to provide it in such a way that it's very equitable. So it, it depends where you are as to whether that's a, a rule that you need to follow. But I do think it's better practice anyway to provide offline and online options. I, I have a feeling, look, I, I'm not working with students in a classroom at the moment, but my gut feeling is that it, this is probably a better time to work on reinforcing things that students have already learnt or practising things that students have already learnt rather than introducing a whole stack of new skills or new things to learn, new concepts and so on. Reinforcement and practice, it's a great time to do that. You might introduce some sort of smaller things but anything big, new concepts is going to be harder at this time because you're just not there in person with them. It's great to provide a choice of activity. So if your outcome is, um, I don't know, some sort of rhythmic aspect, you want students to perform some sort of rhythmic thing, uh, there may be many ways that they can show you that skill. You don't have to have a single sort of option. It could be a choice of activities to show you what they know. And I really think this last point, it's okay at the moment to use ready-made content, other people's content. It's okay to do that at the moment, especially while you're kind of getting started and getting settled and maybe learning a new tech skill or something like that, working out where you are. If you have to learn all of that stuff and also make a whole heap of assignments in an online format because, you know, you've got to make videos and cre create digital resources for it, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work all at once. So I think in the very early stage, it's, it's perfectly acceptable and even later down the track to use some things that have been shared by other teachers or videos on YouTube that are quality educational videos and you yourself can curate those. You can choose what fits with your curriculum and the activities that you're doing with your students and you can also frame them. So you might find a video that's super useful. You want to use that for your kids. Someone else has made it. But you as a teacher might make a little introductory video which tells your students how you want them to use the video, what you want them to take from it, what they need to focus on in the video, what they're going to listen to and then repeat or perform, whatever it is. So you can curate material that way. Okay, so let's talk about how you're going to create and deliver content. Now, um, I think, did I warn you at the beginning? <laughs> My aim always is to kind of aim for like 60 minutes of me delivering content to you in these webinars. And I can tell you today, this is not going to happen. Um, the other ones have run closer to 90 minutes of me talking at you. And I'm pretty sure we're absolutely going to get there today. I just got too excited about all the things I wanted to share with you. Uh, so anyway, I will keep going, but um, I'll, I'll just warn you that now. There was so much stuff. Even this morning, I was still adding some things into this. <laughs> so indispensable tools for creating content for your students are basically these two things. Something that allows you to create video slash audio stuff. So video, audio, creation software. And that can be just the video creation software because that does audio at the same time. Or it could be something that just records audio either. Um, and then your presentation software. Uh, those two things, if you are creating lots of stuff using those, there's a lot of flexibility with both of those options. And I want to talk about each of those a little bit more. Okay, so let's talk video first of all. Video is, um, I think, so useful and so super important at this time. I want to show you some examples of types of videos that you might consider making with your students. And these do not have to be fancy. We are not talking you going out to buy some video camera special thing. You don't need to go get lighting. You don't need to even have a full face of makeup on when you're doing your videos. 
you just need to start really simple. So examples of videos might be this sort of thing where you're just in front of the camera and you're playing or singing or speaking. So this is the lovely Scott Watson, Dr. Scott Watson, who's in the States and his daughter, Abby, and they have made a couple of videos which are band warm-up videos. They're just playing in front of the camera. Scott occasionally talks through what's going on in the next warm-up, you know, what, what the students need to concentrate on and so on, but it's just them in front of the camera. Another example of a face-to-camera type video is um, this two lovely people from Kaboom Percussion. They do some great videos and they, it's just them in front of the camera doing their thing with drumsticks. So really great. The next still shot is me and my son, Josh. This was actually a few years ago. He is now taller than me. <laughs> so I know this was quite a while ago. This is us doing a clapping game called Boom, Snap, Clap, and I'll show you where you can uh, see that whole video if you want to do that with your, your students. Um, and again, we just have the camera set up. It's in the living room in our old house, not the current house, and we just hit record one day and we did this video really quickly. Another type of video that you might consider, and this is where things get really useful and you can get quite creative, is a video where you can share your screen. So you actually record whatever is on your computer screen. And this can include a picture of you in the corner so the students can see you talking and or singing and they can see your face. Or you don't have to do that. You can just have it like you're watching me now. You can hear my voice and see my screen but nothing else. You can't see my face at the moment. So that's the super useful one. And I'm going to show you a couple of different examples of ways you can use this. But here's me just talking over the top of a slide that I'm showing. So I created this slide in, it was actually in Keynote on my Mac, and I'm talking about that on the video there. Now, last night I had um, some fun. <laughs> I'm going to show you these slides in a moment. But it occurred to me, you know, like with lyric videos that you see on YouTube, like a pop song and it's got the lyric, like one line at a time of lyrics. And I thought that'd be so super easy to create for students, for like kids songs, young student songs. Um, it's not a very good resolution picture here. I'm going to show you a better picture of this in a moment. But I created just um, the first, like one verse of Old MacDonald Had a Farm and I put like one or two lines on each of the slides and then I recorded myself singing the song and I advanced the slides one at a time as I was singing that line of the song. This is so super easy to do. I can't tell you how easy this is and it makes a nice, really nice sing-along video for your students. So you can send this to them. They can sing it with their parents or siblings at home and you can be reinforcing something they, they don't know. Maybe you even teach them a new song this way. Um, this works really well also, um, not Old MacDonald is not an echo song, but if you have an echo song that you do where you sing a line and then leave a gap for the students to sing, they're repeating that line and so, so forth, back and forth, that's a great way to do a little teaching video for them. You record your voice doing it. Now, of course, you can find lots of videos on YouTube. I mean, there would be probably hundreds of videos of Old MacDonald Had a Farm on YouTube that I could just send my students. But if it's me and my voice, they, they kind of like that. You're the teacher. They know you. They like to see you and hear you. So you can make your own ones really fast. Screen sharing is another example um, with something like uh, scores. So sheet music, notation, this is a full score, um, like a choral arrangement, but it could be just a single line of notation. It could be very simple if you've got very young students. But again, you can just hit record and if you need to talk through what's going on in a score, that's the thing you can be showing on your screen while you're narrating over the top. Okay, so which tool are you going to make to create your videos? So there's two things I want to talk about here. I want to talk about creating the videos and I want to talk about sharing the videos. Sharing the videos is where a lot of people get tripped up and this becomes the really hard thing. I, I've seen on Facebook in the last few days many people saying, oh my gosh, I've made all these videos and now I can't upload them to the place I need to upload them or I can't share them here. I'm going to talk about what I think are the best options and the easiest options, which will save you all of that heartache. 
So in terms of what to use to actually make your videos, um, you need to consider what do you want to record in the first place. So I like a video recording option that allows me to record myself in front of the camera and my screen with my voice over the top or all three of those things, my screen, my voice and show my face in a little circle or a square in the corner. Now, the best options for this, which are quick and easy and free, are Loom, Screencastify and Flipgrid. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those. I'm going to talk through what it looks like when you do one in Loom. It's basically the same kind of steps in Screencastify. We just don't have the time for me to run through both. I've chosen Loom because I already had the instructions worked out and, and sort of screenshotted and everything. So I'm going to talk through that. I will briefly mention Flipgrid afterwards as well because I think that's a great option too. I'm going to tell you also why these are better options than using your phone or QuickTime on a Mac. That's probably the two main things. I was trying to think of another example there. These are better options. So let's talk about why and I'm going to run through how you actually get started with these if you've never used them before. So Loom and Screencastify, they work roughly the same. They're both free Chrome extensions. You go to the, the Chrome extension store, whatever it is called, Chrome Web Store. If you just search for Screencastify and, and when you search for Loom, just type Loom video because when you type Loom and hit Google search, you'll get pictures of like a weaving loom and you'll think, what on earth is this? Um, just type Loom video and you'll get taken to the place where you can go to the Loom website and download the extension. Um, I've done that a few times in the last few days. It makes me laugh. So the Chrome extensions, extensions you install um, they both allow you to record your tab audio. Now, what does this mean? This means that you can record the audio that's coming out of something that's showing on a browser tab, like a YouTube video or Incredibox website or the Chrome Music Lab uh, tools website thingies. Uh, if you have something playing in Incredibox, you can hit record in screen Castify and Loom, and they will actually record the audio coming out of Incredibox, which means that you can save what you've done in that website uh, without needing to download or export from the website itself, because that's not really an option at the moment. You sort of have to either pay for it or get the app version and so on. So this is a great way to do that. Now, Loom, one difference between Loom and Screencastify is that Loom has an iOS app which allows you to create really fast, quick videos on your phone if you want to. Screencastify does not have that, at least not yet. Screencastify has an annotation feature which Loom does not have yet unless you're using the desktop app on a Mac only. So Screencastify kind of has that over Loom. Sharing videos on both of these options is super, super easy. And you basically, as soon as you've finished recording, you get a link to your video instantly. You do not need to download, upload, export, compress anything. You just get a link straight away. Now, I, I've been saying this and banging on about this for, well, actually years now. But uh, at the moment, I'm still seeing people have trouble with, I've made a video on my phone and I've downloaded it and now it's too big for me to upload to my um, email, you know, for the students or to Google Classroom or to Google Drive, whatever. And I'm having these troubles and now I need to compress it first and then do this. Just please just try Screencastify or Loom. You're just going to find the workflow so much quicker and easier. The last thing I'll say about these is that um, the, you can have the links to your videos set as private, so they're, they're like unlisted links. The world is not going to see them, only the person that you send them to. And one of the great benefits about both of these options is that there are no adverts. So when you send the, the video to your student, there are not going to be adverts that play in the video itself. So process for creating videos. First of all, plan your video. That, that could be like three dot points on a piece of paper next to you or it could be a more fully fledged plan. I th at least think through what I'm going to do in a video before I hit record and I get stuff ready. So if I'm going to show slides during my video, 
I open them up, I get to the first slide, I make it look nice, make sure everything, you know, things that I don't want to show in the video that are on my computer, I will make sure they're not showing. Uh, all of that, just get that ready first and then you hit record. It's not the end of the world if you hit record and then fiddle around. You can trim the beginning off of your video, that's fine, but it's good to just get it ready. Then you're going to open up Loom or Screencastify through there's a little button on your Chrome browser. You'll click on that. You'll do your settings, which I'm going to walk through in a moment. Um, click record and do your thing. And that's that's basically it. And as I said, at the end, you'll get this link that you can share straight away. I want to show you what this looks like while you're actually doing it. So I'm going to show you the screenshots from Loom. And like I mentioned before, Screencastify is roughly the same. I think you'll be able to work it out. And besides that, there are many YouTube videos on how to use Screencastify and Loom anyway, which you can go and watch. So when you first click on uh, the Loom button, this is what you see. You'll see a little menu there and you get to choose some options. So let me run through them. So you click on the button. That's what the button looks like, the, the one where the number one is. It's that little um, Loom sort of flower icon. You'll click on that and you see this first of all. It's like a little drop down menu that appears on the right hand side of your Chrome browser. Now you, you go in there and you're going to choose some options. I like to open up the ad show advanced options area. In Screencastify, I think it's called more options and same sort of thing. You'll get more options for your setup of your video. Now on the next screen, there are, there are a number of things to look at. It's not that confusing. <laughs> so let me just run briefly through them. So at the number one that you can see on the picture there on the right hand side of the screen, you're just going to choose what is it that you're going to record. Is it screen and camera at the same time? Is it screen only or is it camera only? So you click on the, the one that you choose. At number two, you're going to choose, are you recording your full desktop or the current tab? So if you just want to record something on a web browser tab and it's a single tab only, let's say for an example, the Incredibox website, you could choose current tab. If you want to record something on a tab and then you're going to switch over to uh, a different uh, application that you've got open like say PowerPoint, you would want to choose full desktop so that you can move around in whatever's open on your computer while you're recording. At number three and number five, you're going to choose your camera and your microphone. So whatever is attached to your uh, laptop or inbuilt to your laptop, there will be options in that menu there. So I never change the camera source because I've only ever got my Mac inbuilt camera and so that's what it's using, my FaceTime camera. At number five, you can see there's an option to choose the microphone. So if I've got an external microphone plugged in, like I do right now, you'll be able to see it in that menu. You'll also see the option of using the inbuilt microphone and you just choose which one you want to use. Now I'm going to go back to number four where it says flip camera. Um, not many teachers will care about this, but as a music teacher, this is the one you need to know about <laughs> if you're particularly recording an instrument. So if you're playing the piano, as an example, and you have that little button checked which says flip camera, it's going to flip your piano image. Like when the kids watch the video, the high notes are going to look like the low notes and the low notes are going to look like the high notes. So you want to make sure that's unchecked. And I was going to say it's mainly for piano teachers uh, if you'd look keyboard stuff, but to be honest, any instrument, if you are playing a wind instrument, you don't want your hands to look um, backwards. So recorder, for instance, you want to look like you've got your left hand on top and right hand at the bottom. So just make sure that's unchecked. If you are just singing and or talking into the camera, that's not going to be a big deal. So, so don't worry about it in that instance. But that's where you'll turn that off if that's what you're, you, you're doing. And down the bottom, um, optional things that you can turn on or off. Uh, if you are screen only, only recording your screen, you can still choose to have a little profile picture showing. I tend to turn that off. Why take up the room on the screen with my photo? I, I don't need it there, so I turn that off. And there's a couple of other options down there too. So it's once you have used Loom and Screencastify, you'll run through this screen really fast. You'll just go chick, 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 chick. Okay, done. 
When you've hit the start recording button, it doesn't start recording straight away because it's going to ask you what are you recording first of all. And this is, I think, mainly if you choose that full desktop option. So if you choose your full desktop, it's going to say what is the thing on your desktop you actually want to record? Is it your entire screen or is it just Sibelius that you've got open, for instance? You'll just click on the box. So click where I've got that big red arrow and then hit share. Once you hit share, you're going to see the countdown, three, two, one, and you'll start talking. I don't know if anyone else breaks out in a small sweat when they see the countdown, three, two, one, <laughs> start recording. I don't anymore, but I used to. <laughs> okay, when you have, you do your thing and then you'll press the stop button. And when you finish, this is what you see. This is the screen that shows the video that you've just made. You can press play to, to watch it back and make sure it's okay. At number one there on my labelled picture, you can change the title of the video. That's really useful um, because it will automatically give the title of whatever browser tab you were on or something like that, I think, from memory. Just change it. So if mine is a welcome video to someone specific, I will actually say welcome Sarah or something like that in the title of the video. Uh, at number two, I'm going to jump across to the other side there, there are some options there for editing your video. That's where you can click on the trim button and trim off the beginning and end if you want to. Um, there's uh, at number three, there are some options there for either downloading, duplicating, trashing or sharing your video. And you can click on that little share arrow there and you'll see more options in that menu for sharing your video. However, at number five, you can see the big copy link button. So most of the time, you're just going to send someone the link to your video. And that is there very obviously, very easy to find. You'll just click on that button and then send the link to someone. And underneath that at number four, that's where you can set the privacy of the sharing of your video. Now, I will just say in where I've got number two on the picture and there's a settings button, if you go into that settings menu, you can turn on and off a few extra things like the ability to uh, for people to comment on your video. You can turn on or off those reaction buttons. Uh, you can turn on and off the number of views that the video has had for other people. So you can see them as the teacher and you can turn that off for the students if you don't want them to know how many people have watched it. Um, there's a few other options in there as well. So just click around, do your settings and, and that's it. Now with Loom and Screencastify, when you have recorded your videos, they are stored in the Loom and Screencastify website, well server. So they store your videos for you. They do not take up space on your own hard drive, which is a massive bonus. But having said that, if you want to download it to your laptop, you absolutely can on both of these services. So a lot of the time you do not need to download it, but you can if you want to. So where I've got number three on the screen there, there's a little download button and that will download an MP4 file to your laptop, which you can save or do even do other stuff with if you want to. Now, the... Um, with both of these services, once again, you get access to a library of your videos. So once you've recorded a few, you end up with a library, a collection of videos, which you can go back to at any time. So if you made a video three weeks ago explaining to a student uh, how they need to, um, let's say, uh, search for or click on an assignment in Google Classroom, if you were teaching them how to do that, and then another student comes along and needs to know the same thing, you can go back and just find the link to the video you recorded three weeks ago and send that to them. So you end up with a library of videos of your own. You can sort them into folders. You can see on my library here, I've got up the top a few, um, a few little uh, folders there that I've put stuff in. I have not been good at sorting stuff <laughs> recently and a lot of things are not in folders. Uh, I, in my online community where I have uh, professional development, um, you know, online courses and tutorials and a forum, I actually video record a lot of my answers to people's questions. I, it's, I find it so much quicker to hit record and speak my answer than typing it out in a forum sort of place. So I will actually record a, a response to them that way. 
whenever someone new joins the community, I also do a little welcome video. So I say, hi, thanks for joining. Great to see that you're from, you know, Nova Scotia in Canada. <laughs> and, and I'll talk through whatever they've mentioned in their welcome post. All right. How's everyone going? I'm just checking over. Okay. It looks like everyone's going well. Okay. Um, and I will just say with Screencastify and Loom, um, each of them have had or, or have in theory, their free versions have slight limitations. But uh, having said that, they're both very usable even just with the free version. But also at the moment, like most other software companies, they have made their premium versions available at no cost for educators. So at the moment, you just can kind of do everything, which is really great. I just want to show you about recording the audio coming out of a website. So if you wanted to bring up a YouTube video and you want to play a bit of the YouTube video and say to the students, all right, I want you to watch um, this ukulele tutorial. You're going to watch this section here and this person's going to teach you how to play the G chord. And you can play a bit of that YouTube video and then you want to speak more to the students after that. You can actually turn on the ability to record the tab audio. So in Loom, and there's a similar thing in Screencastify too, you need to first of all choose screen and cam or screen only up the top where number one is. Then you have to choose current tab in order to activate this feature. So turn on current tab. And then in the advanced settings, you need to make sure that include tab audio is turned on. By default, from memory, I think it's off. You just need to go in and turn it on each time. And then you'll be able to record the audio from the YouTube video as well as your voice speaking over the top. Or it could be the audio from Incredibox or Chrome Music Lab or Beepbox or whatever music website you might have open on your laptop. Now, also, um, with Screencastify and Loom, you don't just have to record things that are on a browser tab. You can actually record other apps on your, your laptop. So, for instance, if I have Keynote open or PowerPoint open, I can hit the record button in Loom and Screencastify and actually record PowerPoint or Keynote and what I'm showing there. You do need to start on a browser tab, though, and, and click your little button for Loom or Screencastify, and then you just switch over to Keynote or PowerPoint during the 3, 2, 1 countdown. If you don't switch quick enough, not a big deal because you can trim at the beginning of your video. Okay, let's talk. I, look, I'm not going to talk about all sharing all the videos in all the different places, but I do just want to talk about Google Classroom because this is the thing that I've seen pop up I don't know, particularly in the last two weeks, I reckon, so many people um, having trouble sharing videos inside Google Classroom. And I just want to talk about a few different approaches to doing this. So in Google Classroom, and I know not all of you are using Google Classroom, but a lot of you are. So that's why I thought it was worth mentioning. In Google Classroom, there are a few ways you can share videos with your students. So let's say you've made a video of your own using Screencastify or Loom or even some other option, and then you want to share it with your students. Now, if you have the video file itself, MP4, whatever it is, and you want to put it in Google Classroom, it actually pops it into your Google Drive and then shares a link to the video inside your Google Drive. I'm pretty sure that that's how it works. And this is the thing I've seen people have problems with and they've hit limits on number of views or space like storage wise. Um, things are just not playing well. Uh, it's a bit glitchy. Students are having trouble viewing the videos. All sorts of things are going wrong. And I actually think maybe there's it's a better thing to approach this in a different way. So I've put best practice up the top there and because it made me think about when you own your own website, if you own a website like I do, there is an option for me to upload videos directly to my website. I can go into the back end of my website, hit an upload button and upload the video there. And if you do that, it's it's the worst thing that you can do for your website. <laughs> so you do not do that when you own a website ever. I don't even know why there's the facility to do it because it's just not best practice. And in the very early days of me having a website, I did used to do that. And someone who know, knew a lot better than I did said, what on earth are you doing? You're, you're going to ruin your website. 
So you don't actually do that. Um, the, the best practice approach is that you store your video somewhere that's designed to store videos like YouTube or Vimeo. And then all you do on your website is actually link to that video. You link to it or embed it. So it's stored somewhere else, but it shows on your website. And I think this is possibly a better approach with Google Classroom. Now, this is just me thinking this through. I haven't done a lot of Googling to see if this is what actually people recommend and Google itself recommends, but I'm guessing they're probably encouraging you to use YouTube as the storage solution for your videos. And then you just link to those in Google Classroom. Now, you can link to YouTube videos or Vimeo is a similar service to YouTube. Um, you could also link to ones that live there if you have a Vimeo account. Um, Screencastify and Loom, I just showed you also that you have a library there of videos which you can also link to. So instead of uh, downloading the video from Loom and then uploading to Google Classroom, you would just grab that link and paste the link in your Google Classroom assignment or teaching materials area or even in the announcement stream kind of bit. Flipgrid also has the same thing, so I'll mention that in a moment. Now, some of you might be thinking, look, YouTube, are you, ki are you kidding me? I don't want to have YouTube videos. I don't want the world to see my videos. I only want my kids. I want it to be kind of private. I don't want related ads to pop up at the end. I don't want the facility for commenting on YouTube itself. Now, I'm going to say to you, there are ways to have your videos on YouTube without any of that happening. So, one thing that you would do is make your videos unlisted. That means that they can't be found. If people search for videos, yours will not show up as an option if they are unlisted in YouTube. The other thing that's really useful at the moment, and this is a more recent thing, is that YouTube has really um, had to crack down on videos that are intended to be shown to kids. And what they now have is you can either set this up for your whole YouTube channel or for individual videos, is that you can designate your video as for kids, for children. What this means is that the YouTube video will not have any comments allowed on the video and it will not show ads that are inappropriate for that age group. It does not completely stop ads from showing at all as I understand it, but it will stop ads that are not right for children at least showing on it. So that's something you can use uh, and do if, if you're using YouTube. Uh, Screencastify and Loom, again, you can just grab the link and share it there and Flipgrid the same sort of thing. I'm just going to briefly show you what it looks like in Google Classroom. So when you are setting an assignment uh, for your class or even um, announcing something, this is what it looks like. You type something in in the bit where it says share with your class and you click on the add button which is underneath with the paper clip and then you choose one of the options there so if you have something on youtube you would choose that and put the link in or search for it on youtube but i actually often choose just the link option in that menu and then i paste in the link to my loom video my screencastify video my youtube video my vimeo video whatever it is flipgrid and it will show in the classroom assignment exactly the same way as if you had done it through Google Drive. So this is this is what it looks like once you've posted videos in Google Classroom. I've got four different examples here and I've done different things. So the top left, create a lyric video for a children's song. That's an assignment in Google Classroom and you can see a little preview of a Loom video there. The one underneath that I created in a Flipgrid Shorts video and you can see I've posted that. And again, it's just a little preview of the video that the, the students can click on and watch. There is a YouTube video at the top right. And then the assignment one on the, the right hand side underneath that, that shows you an assignment with materials attached to it. So they all kind of look the same. I think that's possibly a better approach than trying to upload to Google Drive all the time. Someone may tell me I'm completely wrong <laughs> about this, but that's the way I would do it personally. <laughs> okay, so let's just talk briefly about Flipgrid. I've talked about Screencastify and Loom a lot. Flipgrid is the third option, which is fantastic for making videos. Really, really good and super easy to use. And it's slightly different to the other two tools. So Flipgrid's actually designed for you as a teacher to set up a topic for your students. You set them some kind of assignment and 
this is a way for you to get videos back from them really easy. It's set up so that uh, the topic that you have uh, is, is like the one that you can see on the right there. At the top, you can see my instructions for what to do. And at the bottom, there are people who have already responded to my topic by recording themselves, um, recording a little video of themselves. Now, when a student sees the topic, they just need to click on that big green plus button and that's how they add their video to the topic grid. This is the perfect solution if you want to gather videos from students playing assessments, rhythmic examples, or if you just want them to talk through something, maybe you just want them to share what is your favourite song this week? What is the song that you like to sing with your family members? Can you show me an instrument that you have at home that I don't know about already? Um, do you want to introduce your pet to me? Like any of those things, they can just make a quick video for you and they can be super short or they can be longer. Uh, in the past, it's been up to five minutes. I'm pretty sure Flipgrid just announced up to 10 minutes. Um, having said that, you as a teacher can put the limit on how long you want the student videos to be. So if you don't want little Sarah rambling on about her cat for 10 minutes, you'd make the video one minute in length and just say, right, you got one minute, go for it. This is a free tool. It's owned by Microsoft and it's totally free and it works on any device. I'm just going to also briefly, I'm not going to spend too much time on Flipgrid because I already mentioned I'm going to do a whole session about Flipgrid next week. Apparently everyone voted for that on Monday, even though I don't think I actually asked for votes, but that's just how it worked. Um, but it is a great one to do. So the sorts of things that you might consider Flipgrid for are students submitting playing assessments to you, singing something, performing a rhythm, verbal responses, teaching someone else something. They can make that a video of that. Um, I know some of you have been doing talent shows with your students and this is how they're submitting their entry into a talent show. I do want to mention though, and this is the reason for talking about it alongside Screencastify and Loom, is that Flipgrid has a standalone video recorder option. So you don't just have to have a topic that's set up for your students to respond to. You as a teacher can use what they call their shorts camera or video recorder. And it's a standalone thing, so it does not have to be attached to a topic or a grid or anything. You can just make a video and it's like the way that you would in Screencastify or Loom. In the Flipgrid one, it actually has some extra things that Screencastify and Loom don't have. And that it has the webcam feature, obviously. It also has a whiteboard feature. Uh, Screencastify actually has that too, I think. Um, but there's a whiteboard feature. You can bring up like a whiteboard on the screen that you can draw on. You can draw with a pen. So if you wanted to show students this is how you draw a treble clef, you can hit record and show them how to form the treble clef shape. It has a screen record function now as well, which has just been introduced or announced, I think, last weekend. It has the ability to add stickers and emoji and so on. And as I mentioned, you can now record up to 10 minutes. Once you've recorded your Flipgrid shorts video, if, if you're do, using this for a teaching video, you can end up with a link to that video that you share somewhere, a QR code, you can embed it, you can post it directly to Google Classroom, Teams or Remind and like the others, you can also download it too. All right, how are we going? I'm just going to check over and, and make sure everyone's okay. Okay, great. Yep. Looks like everyone's good. Excuse me while I have a drink of water. I keep forgetting to do this. <laughs> then I end up not being able to talk by the end. All right, let's talk about digital teaching materials. So creating your own digital teaching materials. So this is, you know, how are you going to send stuff to students and what's it going to look like? Now, I like to use presentation software, so PowerPoint, Keynote, um, Google Slides are the three primary options here. And using your presentation software for things other than presentations is a really good thing. So you can think beyond the traditional uses of those software programs and basically use these as a graphic design tool. The reason for using these is that it allows you to manipulate things freely on the slide. If you use Google Docs or Microsoft Word or Pages on a Mac, 
it's much harder to manipulate elements on the screen. You would have all tried adding, I don't know, a picture of a quaver into the middle of some text and then tried to position it correctly and it's fiddly and it won't quite go where you want it to and it flicks around and then you've got to change the settings of the image and it's just really annoying. It's much better to use one of these options instead. And you can use them to create printed material like worksheets or handouts, but you can also use them if you are able to use technology with your students at this time. You can also use these to create interactive digital activities as well. And I'm going to just show you, I'm going to go through these quite quickly, just show you some visual examples of different sorts of things you can create in your presentation software just to get the ideas flowing. So this is one that I created um, as an example for a workshop that I was running. It's just a rhythm reading stick notation teddy bear thing. <laughs> and I made that in, uh, I think it was Keynote on my Mac. So I put that all together using shapes and lines and images. That's all there is to that. And if you want to know more about how to create these things, I've actually got a, a, a separate webinar. It's a recorded one on my website. I will try to remember to link to that. Um, but I go through how you actually build these up from scratch. This is another example of something that you can create using the presentation software. So again, this does not look like a presentation slide. I changed the dimensions of the slide to be more like A4 or letter paper size. So it's a printable thing. And this is where students can draw, print it out and draw a line from the part um, to the number on the guitar. Another example of something that you might create in your software is something like this. It's a play along thing. So um, this is the sort of thing that I would make ahead of making a teaching video. I would put this together and then on the video, you can have a little picture of you in the corner singing and playing your ukulele and showing this on the screen for the students so that the students can sing or play along with you. So it becomes a play along video with this showing prominently on the screen, but still showing your face doing, doing whatever it is that you're showing. This is another one. Again, this is um, a collection of images that I put together. There's text for the lyrics. The images, um, you know, I've got the raindrops representing the pictures there just on a couple of lines. And that again is just created in uh, PowerPoint or Keynote, one or the other. Google Slides um, is a great one. And in all of the software programs, you can create these drag and drop type activities. So this is something where you might give this file to the students and they're actually going to maneuver, move around the dynamics on the screen and put them in the correct order. Google Slides is the best option for this because you can share the Google Slides file with your students and you can either set it up so that each student gets their own copy of the Slides file or like this example that I've got, down the left-hand side, you can actually see the sl same slide, multiple copies of the same one. You can actually set it up that way for your students where they're all collaborating in the one single Google Slides document and each of them is assigned their own slide. So Mary might be number slide number four, David might be slide number five, Andrew is slide number six, and each of the students completes their activity on their own slide, but you have just the single slides document that they're all working in. And again, this one I just made myself. So the background is just, I had a blue background, all blue. I found a green shape, which sort of had a curved line and I, I'm, made it green and it now looks like the grass and then I found two clip art images which you can search for actually within Google Slides it will come up with images that you're able to use legally and I popped them on the slide for decoration just to show quiet to loud and then I had my own notation images that I've created and again I've shared those on my website so you can all use them too and I popped them all onto the slide and the students can maneuver those around the elements that you can see, the arrow, the mouse, the elephant, the background colours are all locked down into place so that they cannot move around accidentally. The students can only move the dynamics around on the screen and they just click on them with their mouse and drag them into place or finger on iPad. <laughs> Brill I just glanced over. Brilliant slide activity. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not really reading the, the comments, but <laughs> I did just see that one. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, this is the one that I did last night, like 11.30 at night. <laughs> I was just wanting to put together an example of a lyrics video. And actually it occurred to me, if you've got sort of upper elementary students, uh, I reckon an awesome project, like tell me if you think this is good, an awesome project for your older students would be to make a lyrics video for the younger students. You know how there's that project all the time of the older kids reading a storybook for younger kids? I reckon get them to make a lyric video. So they would just choose a children's song, like a nursery rhyme, and they're going to put the lyrics onto some slides and choose images to go with them to decorate it like I'm about to show you. And then they can press they can press record themselves, the students, on Loom or Screencastify and record their own singing or in Flipgrid, um, record their own singing and you can then send that to the younger kids. I thought that would be cool. So I did Old MacDonald. I chose these little, the circular images are beautiful and they're from Canva. So I use Canva a lot for images and I found some, just a collection of farm related images. I did, this is the, the title one. So I split up the lyrics on each slide. So, I'll, and and basically this is what I did in the video. I just sang, Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. And on that farm he had a cow, E-I-E-I-O, with a moo-moo here and a moo-moo there, and so on. So I just put the lyrics on different slides. I changed the colour here and there just to emphasise the sound of the animal. And I put a different image on each one to, to illustrate it. I didn't do the rest of the verses. You'll be so disappointed. I'm not going to sing them all for you now. But, but that was the activity. So I, I think this is a great thing. And um, essentially with showing something like this uh, while you're singing or playing, it's a great way to engage the students. It doesn't just have to be you and your face on the camera all the time. You can show slides like this, which can illustrate anything. You might have notation showing. It might be a single picture. It might be, it could be just a photo. It could be anything just to illustrate whatever it is that you're doing. Canva, that is the correct spelling. Uh, the person who wrote that in the chat window. Hi from Ontario. Yes. All right. Let's talk about lesson ac and activity ideas. This is the bit I really, really wanted to get to. Um, I'm going to continue on. And just to reiterate, if you do need to finish up and go and do something else because you're teaching or whatever right now, uh, you can catch up with the recording and um, watch the rest if you need to at a later stage. So in terms of how to present your content, how to actually kind of think about it for the students at this time I do think it's worth uh, maybe not approaching things the way you would normally in a normal situation where you're all in the classroom together in this online format things do need to be a little bit different so one of the most popular things at the moment oh my goodness is choice boards if you do a search for choice boards or bingo boards or tic-tac-toe activity grids they're all kind of the same thing. They are so super popular for this online learning format. And there's a number of good reasons for that. And I do think it's a great thing to consider. You might not want to do it all the time, but I think it's a great thing to consider. So, and I'm going to show you lots of pictures of choice boards and activity boards just to show you the types of things that you can do. So if you haven't seen these before, it's basically a grid on a piece of paper or on the screen and there are squares and each square has a different activity in it for students to choose from. Now, the students themselves generally select which ones they're going to complete. And I'm actually going to show you the ways that you can ask the students to select. You can structure it somehow or give them free choice totally, um, many different ways. And to be honest, it occurred to me in the shower a couple of days ago that it would be awesome to have a th an overarching theme for your choice board, perhaps. It, you may Again, you may not always do this, but I and this is so weird. So <laughs> I was listening to the fabulous podcast by Carrie and Tanya, which is the Music Teachers Coffee Talk. Did I say that right? Music Teachers Coffee Talk podcast. So hello to those two. Um I was listening to their latest episode and and the day before I'd thought, oh, I think themed choice boards would be a great idea. And the, the thing that popped into my head was a whole choice of activities to do with found sounds. I'm listening to their podcast yesterday and Carrie, I think it was Carrie, said the same thing. It was like ESP. It was so weird. 
she said, you know, she's doing um, this sort of themed week about found sounds. And I just thought, huh, there you go. I think it is a great idea to do that. So shout out to those guys and, and do listen to their podcast if you don't already. They actually gave me a few shout outs during that episode. So thank you very much if you're listening. Um, but themed um, activity boards, you can do lots of things with these activity boards. And I think it becomes, as a teacher, when you're trying to think of activities for your choice board, you can be overwhelmed with the options because there are so many things you can do. If you put in place a theme for yourself in the first instance, it's so much easier to kind of structure things and think of activities around one theme. I'm going to suggest some theme ideas to you, but in the meantime, I'm going to show you examples of other people's choice boards. Now, these have all been shared on Facebook in different places. I have put the names of the person and the Facebook group that I found them. In most cases, I managed to ask them permission to show them. Um, a couple I didn't quite get to, so I apologise, but do go and look them up. They are sharing them freely in these Facebook groups. So, um, yeah, just go and check them out. The, uh, this one's by Mel Janelle, and this was shared in the Music Educators Creating Online Learning Facebook group. So um, hers looks great. You know, it's, it's um, well made from a graphic design point of view, but you can see there there are different uh, squares and each of them has a different activity in it. Now, as a teacher, you have the option of just describing the activity in full in the grid, or sometimes people will put a link to more information or this is what I want you to complete, click through to this thing, or here's a video to watch and you'll click through to the video. So you need to decide if you need your whole grid to be offline, then that won't work so well. But if you can have some options which are tech-based or they need to watch a video or something else, you can include some links in it. So you can see that there, this grid is for one week of learning and the students need to choose between one and three activities for the week many different ways that you can uh, do this. So this is another example and um, this is by Elaine Ford. She has a Teachers Pay Teachers store which I can highly recommend you going to check out if you want to download an ex um, this exact one and she actually has musical moments for uh, younger students and older students too. She's got lots of different grids. Go to her TPT store which is called Mrs Ford's Melodies and you can download the free choice boards that she has there. And again, she did share the link to this in the Facebook group, but go on to Teachers Pay Teachers and find it there. This is another example. This is an example where specialist teachers have combined onto a single choice board. So each of the columns that you can see is for art, PE, music, library, and SEL. So there are ways that you can combine with other teachers to provide choice boards. This next example is different to all of the others that I've ever seen. <laughs> this one was just shared yesterday in the Australian Classroom Music Teachers Group. Thanks to Joe for um, agreeing to let me show this in the session today. Uh, he made like a handwritten one and this is music of the 80s and 90s. So it kind of has that scrapbook look about it, which I really liked. Um, I believe he did this in Explain Everything where you have like a whiteboard that you can write on with, with your own handwriting. Um, but it does look kind of different and um, it's kind of cool. It's it's really good. So this, I think he said this was for his year 10 students. So it's maybe a bit older than some of you um, teaching today, but you could totally apply the same sorts of things to your own uh, choice boards. So as you can see down the right hand side, he's got different due dates for the different rows of the grid. So due week three is the bottom row, due week six is the middle, due week eight is the top row. So I'm a, uh, it says choose two tasks from each of the rows and they have to hand them in by that date. So again, multiple ways you can do this. Now, this would have been a fair bit of work to put together to decide the task, as with all of the choice boards, decide the task, um, you know, write it out somehow, represent the information succinctly to the students. But Joe's now done for the whole of this period of time. There's multiple weeks of planning that he's just done all in one go. So even though it's a lot up ahead, ahead of time, it's like batch processing your tasks and then you can go on to other things, other grades that he's teaching he might concentrate on or set up things for them. Loving the content says guest 2733. Thank you, I'm glad. <laughs> um, this one uh, was shared by Rakeley in the Facebook group as well. And um, again, this is more for, you know, this is for a band. 
And this is set up less like a choice board, a traditional choice board, but with a structure for each day of the week for her band members. But within each of the squares, the rhythm, dynamics, chorale, articulation and scales and so on down the page, there are choices within each of those squares. So there's structure to the day, but there's still some freedom and flexibility for the students. Now, the biggest thing about these choice boards is that that situation where the student may not have access to a device all the time, this is perfect for those students because they choose when they can complete the activity. They're not bound to doing it at 12 p.m. on a Wednesday. It can be when they can get to it. They can also choose the activities that suit them and their resources at home. So if they need help with something, they can choose something at a time where there is an adult present or they can choose the online option because they know they can use the laptop Thursday afternoon, whatever it is. It just gives that freedom and flexibility. Also, as a learner, it's really nice to have some choice in what you're doing and not be just told outright all the time. So I think that's a useful thing too. Um, this is one which is a band, uh, a band choice board, so a choice board for a band shared by Laura Hunt. And again, the, each of the columns has different categories. So there's music theory, there's watch, listen and read in the second column, there's a just for fun set of activities, perform and maintenance. Again, I love this idea. This next one is by uh, Cherie Herring. Um, she's been sharing activities. Uh, she actually shares them as seesaw activities. They are clickable choice boards again so there's um, information on the actual board itself but then you can click through to more information or the resource that you need to complete them. Um, I can highly recommend going to Cherie's website which is cphmusic.net. She has a, a link to all of this stuff there so go there and grab that but she has so much other useful stuff on there, the lovely Cherie. <laughs> She's an awesome educator and she has many, many resources which are freely available for anyone to use so um, highly recommend going to check her things out. And this next one, I mentioned this in other webinars and it's ready and available, the Musical Olympics. So this is kind of I guess my example of a themed choice board. Um, I wasn't originally going to set this up as a choice board, but then decided it was the perfect format for it. So uh, my idea here is that uh, students choose three Olympic events or more from the grid and there are different Olympic events that they can enter there and they're going to submit a video or audio file to you that shows you them entering the event. So things like, um, if you can't read it on the screen, the lowest note sung or the longest note played on an instrument, the fastest and most accurate performance of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, the most uh, interesting or unusual sound made by your voice. All of these are events, Olympic events that they can enter and they can submit them to you. And then you as a teacher can choose a gold medal winner, a silver medal winner and a bronze medal winner in each of the categories if you want. So there's a lot of students that, gonna, that can possibly win prizes if you want to do it that way. Now, I've actually um, just yesterday uploaded this to Flipgrid because I think Flipgrid is the perfect format or, or platform to do this on. Not the only way you can do it, but really good for Flipgrid. I've uploaded it to share in their shared activities area, which is called the Disco Library. Um, I haven't seen it on there yet. I think it needs to be approved by Flipgrid staff, but it should appear there at some point. But in the meantime, it's actually on my website and I'll post a link in uh, to the chat window at the end or if Martin looks it up and finds it in the meantime, um, it, it can go there. It's a, uh, I, think it, I think it could be a good one. I'd love to hear feedback if you try it with your students and see, see how it works. Gold, it's gold. Yeah, great, thank you. I thought about it a while ago and, um, yeah, just finally got it all together yesterday, so I was happy. So layout options. Um, with your grids, you can lay them out any way you want. You can have as many squares as you want, but here are some common ideas. So one is to lay it out like a traditional bingo board where the free square is in the middle and students are required to do five in a row. So this is where you can have some choice for the students but make them do maybe a, a couple of things that are outside their comfort zone because they need to complete the activities in a row. You don't have to force them to do that. It's just one option open to you. Again, same sort of thing. You can do it as a tic-tac-toe board where they have to do the middle square, but then they can choose two other activities to form a line or a row or whatever it is, a diagonal row. 
There's also the option, like you saw some of the examples, where categories by column. So you might have different types of activities in each column, like a play and a sing and a move and a listen or whatever that is. Or it could be categories like you saw the specialist teachers each had their own column and the students have to um, complete something from each column. And here are just some of the ideas about how students can be um, asked to complete their activity grid. So three in a row or five in a row. Uh, some teachers are saying they need to do the blackout version, which is where they do all of the squares on the grid. So again, it depends on how many squares you've got and how long you're giving to, for the students to do. Um, you might say to the students, you just need to do a minimum of three squares on the entire grid or however many you choose. They can do as many as they can in a given time. They can do one from each column. And uh, one of the ones which I think is really useful, particularly for older students, is to assign a point value to each of the activities. And there might be varying point values depending on how quick the activity is or how involved it is. And then the students need to do enough activities to add up to 100 points or to 50 points or whatever you choose. That's a really great one if you, you know, you don't want all of the students to resort to the very quick and easy tasks that you might have on there. They need to have a variety in there. Um, my own son's teacher, uh, one of them, they, they did this format, but they actually said you can only do one of the two-point activities or two of the two-point activities and you have to include one of the 12-point activities. So you can make them include higher point value activities if you want them to. And activity types, I, I've mentioned these a few, but this is the sorts of things that you can consider in terms of types of activities to include. And I, I think a good choice board has a variety of all these things or most of these things. So a playing thing, a singing thing, a listening, a create, a write. And create could be compose something or it could be um, making, physically making. So physically making an instrument to play found sounds, that could be kind of cool. Writing could be writing music or it could be writing text like an essay or a written response to something. And it's nice to have that fun option in there too. Theme and topic suggestions, I just brainstormed a few of these yesterday. I'm sure there's many, many more that you can think of. You could have a whole grid of found sound activities, all one all to do with clapping games. You could have the history of clapping games. You could have watch a clapping game video and learn how to do it. You could have teach a clapping game to someone else in your household. You could have composer of the month for the whole grid um, where you're doing different activities to do with one composer or a musical style or period. Something to do with video game music is always popular and so is movie music and there are, I'm sure, lots of other options too. All right, uh, tips for choice boards. I'm going to kind of try and speed up a little bit. I feel like I'm, I'm really getting on in time here, so I apologise if it's, <laughs> it's a long one today. Tips for choice boards, um, just some general things. Include offline and online activities. I did mention that earlier. Really good to use the home environment at the moment. So the whole found sounds thing is really useful. Um, you can get kids to do a scavenger hunt where they have to go off and find the something that makes the sound um, with shaking involved or something that makes a high pitch sound or a low pitch sound. Um, they can create an instrument from things that they only have at home. There are actually a lot of videos to do with homemade instruments, some really cool ones. I've actually started a collection of those which I'll share at some point. Things that involve family members can be useful, interviewing a family member about an instrument that they used to play when they were younger or uh, interviewing someone about who's their favourite artist at the moment. Um, giving flexible submission methods is also useful, even within one activity. Uh, if it's a composition activity, for instance, you could ask students to record a video of them performing their composition or they could record an audio file, or maybe they just submit notation to you. So many options there. And the, the generally speaking, the consensus that I'm seeing out there amongst many teachers is that they are providing a grid and then it's for activities for an entire week. So you'd say by the end of this week, you're going to submit this, or it might be even over a two or a three week period. Um, again, it, 
it kind of works well for you if you can get a grid ready that will last you for a week or two, then you're not needing to prepare lots of separate things each day. Or this might be alongside other activities which are standalone that you provide in amongst this interspersed with the activity grid. Now, we have a couple of blog posts which are coming up very soon and there are going to be more because I thought this was such a need at the moment. So um, Katie Miller, who writes regularly for my blog, has done one about sort of an overall guide to choice boards in music education. And she's also written a list of 30 ideas of things that you can put on your choice board in the elementary classroom. We have plans to make one for a the middle school and separately for choir and separately for band slash orchestra, that will probably be one and the same. Um, I think that's all we'll do. So it'll be 30 ideas for choir choice boards and 30 ideas for middle school. So look out for those. Um, I believe that one, those two are going to be published very soon. Okay, I'm just going to finish really uh, briefly, well, maybe not briefly, I'm, I'm going to finish off just by mentioning some ready-made content that I've seen around that I think is really useful. So I, I mentioned at the earlier part of this webinar, I think ready-made, it's fine to use ready-made to supplement your own materials. You can't all be making your own massive library of singing videos at this time and playing videos and all the teaching content. It's okay to use other people's stuff. There's a lot of fantastic stuff out there and other people maybe have better video editing software and lighting and all the things to make it look pretty. Um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time. And as I mentioned, I think the best approach with this is that you personally curate and scaffold whatever it is you're providing for the students. So that that is the way that you add your voice to it and your way of teaching and the students will still want to hear that from you. Um, this is a great option to use while you're learning new tech things. If you're having to learn how to use Loom and Screencastify and they're not hard, but if you're new to that, you know, use some curated content in the meantime. Okay, so, so this I'm going to run through these quite quickly. Places to get great content. Seesaw, if you are using Seesaw, you can sign up for a free account if you're not already using it and access their activity library. Their activities are made by real live teachers in the classroom and they're really good. Um, so my two friends, Amy Burns and Cherie Herring, both use Seesaw and have both contributed multiple activities in the Seesaw library. I can even see Amy's name on the screenshot that I've <laughs> included there but there are many more. I, I just brought up music. You can see there's 1,028 activities in there. So they're just quick activities. Any of these would work well, I'm sure, on a choice board if you want to get a jump start on, on what to include there. Uh, Flipgrid has a similar thing. They have what they call the Disco Library. And this is a collection of pre-made activities in the Flipgrid um, platform that you can just add to your own account and then send out to your students. You can even adjust it. You don't have to use it verbatim. You can add your own text to it or explanation for your students. In terms of videos, there's many fantastic YouTube uh, channels around, but Musication is a really great one, a popular one. Um, I don't know the person, the name of the person, I can't remember who does that, that channel, but they've just started making some home edition videos <laughs> where they're suggesting, you know, here are some things around the house that you can use to do this play along video with. So go and check those out, fantastic ones. The Visual Musical Minds channel is another really great one, really well made videos. Um, I just picked a body percussion example from that channel. Uh, and again, students could be assigned to go and watch that and perhaps learn a body percussion piece that way. Uh, Ollie Tunma, who I believe is from Stomp, uh, has made is, is making a series of body percussion videos. These have been doing the rounds in lots of Facebook groups that I've been in recently. Again, some great simple ones to start with doing body percussion and mouth sounds. Kaboom Percussion, uh, which are Aussie duo, they do fantastic videos as well and they have some tutorials on their website that you can watch. This one popped into my feed uh, the other day, which was a uh, elementary Groove Tracks Found Sounds online video lesson. Um, this one's great. It's uh, It was kind of like a what do you call it, a face-off between found sounds uh, making rhythms and real instruments in inverted commas making rhythms. Really good. And then there's some teaching material in there too. 
I'm just looking at the next slide and realized I forgot to actually fix it up and format it. So I'll just show you what a schmozzle it looks like. <laughs> uh, hilarious. Um, I, I have blog post images on here, which I forgot to resize and make look nice. But um, I have a number of lessons on my website or free resources that you can use. So the biggest one that you can see on the screen there, Musical Me, uh, is a really good one for a choice board. Uh, basically, there's a list of prompts that you can download and students will answer questions. They can pick from the prompts list um, things like, What's your favourite instrument? What's a concert that you've been to that you like? What's your favourite uh, YouTube uh, or TED Talk? Or I don't know. There's a whole series of, of prompts on that list. Um, the one that you can't really see on the right-hand side of the screen is how to make your own sound wave art. <laughs> and the one at the back there, which you can't really see at all, is wrap my name. But anyway, I'll fix that up for the <laughs> download of the slides. <laughs> Now, in the last um, week, I've actually shared five free lessons, like full-blown uh, teaching videos and lesson videos from my online community. I've just picked out a few that I thought would be useful at this time. So there's an Incredibox one called Beatboxer or Singer. There's a video game one, Mario style called, uh, well, that's what it's called, Composer Mario style video game theme using Beatbox. There's one using the Isle of Tune website. I know I'm going through these quickly, but you can read read about them further. Um, there's one using YouTube videos called Better Than the Original, where you get to compare the original song and a cover song. And there's another one called Boom Snap Clap, which is the clapping game that Josh and I were uh, the picture of earlier. And that's using Groove Pizza. And one that I'm going to have hopefully next week ready is I've called the Lockdown Blues. And this will be one where students write the lyrics to a blues song in the AAB format, um, all about being in lockdown. <laughs> so there you go. All right. Last thing. I won't run through all of these. Um, I'm finding podcasts really useful at the moment. So I mentioned uh, Tanya and Carrie's one, Music Teacher Coffee Talk. Um, I've mentioned Amy and Cherie, and that's their websites there. The um, general non-music ones but super useful, Google Teacher Podcast and uh, by the same people, Casey Bell and Matt Miller, are their own podcast called Shake Up Learning and Ditch That Textbook. Really useful at this time. And then there's my podcast at the bottom. I'm going to record some new episodes next week as well. I'm, I'm trying to speed up so I, I nick in under the 90-minute mark here. So <laughs> a few final thoughts before we open up for questions. Um, and I've said this in all of the webinars, it's just the best approach is just to give things a go. I know it's scary when you've not done it before and you can't see and feel it and work, know how it works. You just have to give it a go. That's the only way to overcome that feeling. Done is definitely better than perfect. Do not worry if you haven't done your hair that day and you've got to record a video, hit record and do it anyway. I'm doing that more and more now. If you looked at all the videos in my Loom account, um, you can see the days where I'm like, I just want to record this greeting video for someone because it's been a day and I have not got my hair or makeup done. I've got glasses on, no contact lenses. <laughs> and I'm like at that point where, you know what, I feel like the message is more important than the way I look. So just do it. The kids don't care. Um, and if you're worried, even if you are doing getting dressed nicely and putting your hair and makeup and all that, um, don't still don't worry about what you look like on video because honestly you look the same on video as the kids see you in the classroom every day so even though you might think it's weird that's how they see you every day so don't worry about it you know keep it simple and um, the Facebook groups that I've been finding useful music educators creating online learning and e-learning in music education I have my own Facebook page and I have my own community, so this is the online space where I have courses and tutorials and a forum where I will personally, um, you'll get personal one-on-one -on -one help from me. If you are interested in knowing more about that community, there's a link underneath the video where you're watching at the moment and you can follow up there. So most important things, keep the students making music. I think that's the most important thing. Um, the thing that I keep hearing is that everyone has these grand plans in week one. Week two, they kind of freak out. Week three, they dial it all back, cut everything in half <laughs> or more, um, and then just focus on, you know, really the important thing is that connection with the kids and just keeping them making music. At this time, you're going to have to reassess how you're assessing students. You may not get to assess them the way that you would have been planning on assessment this, at this time. You might just need to dial all of that back. Um, and really important to look after yourself. 
This is what the uh, community looks like. I, I, I'll just flick onto the next screen, which shows you the link for the PD certificate for today, midnightmusic.com.au forward slash Corona Music, which sounds totally like the name of a song. And if you go there, you can uh, download a PD certificate. I will also put that link on the page where you'll be able to download the slides and the watch the video again and so on. All right, I'm going to turn off my screen sharing and just head back onto the screen. <laughs> All right, there we go. I can see you now. Excellent. And I'll, I'll just bring up the chat window so I can catch up on what's been going on. I won't scroll back through forever, but um, I'm, I'm just going to go back a little bit. If I see some questions, I can answer. Um, <laughs> my son's getting used to online meetings with his graphic studio. He's been turning off his camera because he's just waking up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, you can um, – you could just put up a still slide as your video if you wanted to, like a still picture. <laughs> uh, hilarious. So thank you, everyone. So I will stick around for some question and answer time now. Um, I'm sure Martin's been answering questions as is, as we've been going on. But if there is something else that you want to ask, uh, feel free to do that. And uh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad. Thank you for all the thank yous again. I love musication, says De Debbie. Yes, excellent. Uh, Bonnie, thank you. Oh, great. Bonnie feels like she's got a specific direction and a vision now. Thanks. I'm so glad. That was truly my aim for today, like uh, where to start when you just don't know where to start. Um, yeah, it's it, it can be hard. It can be hard to know where to start. In Australia, for those who are watching from the States, in Australia we are really only just getting started with um, online learning. The, the schools are only barely into it or about to start. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, guest people, thank you, Frank. <laughs> Can't wait till the lockdown blues comes out, says Deanna. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, do the – yeah, I think the bingo – whoever said bingo squares with the point system, I reckon that's the guy. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I can't keep up with the comments, so I'm skimming. Um, lucky I read fast. It's a good thing. John, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, they have been lots of work. <laughs> uh, my, my, I've got uh, dark circles today. Thank you, Karinsa. Karinsa, unusual name there. Thank you. I'm glad it's practical and reassuring. That's good. Thank you, Lauren, Dorothy. Awesome. No, uh, yep, okay. Uh, just reading your comment about something was comment covered on Tuesday. Thank you, Sue. Phil, oh, Phil, hello, Phil. I didn't see you on there. Thanks, Meryl, Kim. <laughs> Kim's question, I, I'm going to try and go back to that one. Kim's question about, how did how did I come to develop this outlet? Yeah, um, it's it's been over ten years now. So over the space of ten years, all of these things have happened very gradually. You know, I think it's hard. Sometimes people say, "Oh, I'd like to do that sort of thing," and I'm like, "Well, you can totally." Uh, and I think it's very easy to see where people are at now and want to get there straight away. But it literally has taken me ten years to get to the way I do things right now. Having said that, you can probably cut to the chase with a lot of it. Um, the tech tools, for instance, are much easier than they used to be. Like having your own website is so much easier now than it was 10 years ago. Like it was really fiddly back then. Flipgrid, yes. Flipgrid will be next week. So um, it's going to be – what day is it today? It's Thursday for me. Um, it's going to be Wednesday for me. It'll be Tuesday night. For those of you in the States, it'll be Tuesday, same time, 8 p.m., Eastern Daylight Time and it will be 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time and then the rest of you time signs can work it out. <laughs> you can use those as reference points. So it'll be Wednesday for those in Australia, Tuesday night for those in the States. Um, thank you, Scott Templeton. Nice to see you on. Hope you're going well. All gearing up for next week's. Uh, so in Victoria, where I am, and Scott is also, and many other people on today, we are on officially on holidays at the moment. Holidays, not holiday at all for me. What am I saying? The kids are on holidays and starting up term next week, and this will be the first foray for many into the online learning in Australia. Thank you, Alfreda. Great. Thank you. I'm glad you found it useful. Thank you, Faith. 
Bye. Thanks, Joy. Love singing. Good name. <laughs> Thank you. Paul, Jenny. Uh, Jenny, I did cover um, rehearsals and band orchestra choir I did on Monday in the webinar. So um, I won't be doing another one now, but um, oh, Desley, did the dog come past? Did she? Oh, yeah, she's gone outside. Um, I won't be doing another one on that now. Um, but there are, so if you are conducting a choir, you can watch my webinar that I did Monday and the replay is available for that uh, on general things to do with ensembles. Um, and there's also a really useful Facebook group I'm in called Total Choir Resources, which is run by two women who have a website of the same name. And there's lots of information in there specifically about choir. So I'd definitely go and join that group and check out their website. They've got some free stuff on there and other things. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, so much content. I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, good. Emma, the lyric videos, yes. For the, oh, my gosh, I didn't even think of that for the hearing impaired kids. That would be really good. Yep. Oh, what font did I use on my slide screens? Yeah, great question. Um, it's libel suit. I'll type it in. Libel suit. This is for the headings and the Sarah Pro, or however you say it, is for the bullet point text. Um, scrolling back, I can't remember where I got to. Yeah, so yeah, webinar next week. I just think I covered that one off. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bonnie also teaches, um, that's the hearing impaired, I'm guessing. Uh, Michelle, if you're using Seesaw, Seesaw has its own inbuilt video um, feature, if you know what I mean. So you could use that, but also if you did create something in Loom, you can... I'm pretty sure you can just pop the yeah you can just pop the link into your seesaw you know communications with the students so you'll do a post for the students and pop your link in there I'm pretty sure that will work fine <laughs> great thank you Katrina thank you Sue Bromon loves musication thanks Rachel Claire's going off to download things thank you Katarina right other Rachel. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Martin's doing a Soundtrap webinar next week. Yeah, please, um, you've, have you popped the link in for that? That would be great. Yeah, um, totally good. There's other people running great webinars at the moment. So in the Facebook group, which is called eLearning for Music Education or something, uh, whatever that one's called, um, Nissa Brown, who runs that one, she's doing regular like 10-minute tech uh, interview tutorial type videos. I've done one with her on Loom actually. Um, and on the musetech.net Facebook page, they are doing live Facebook lives every day at 7 p.m. US Eastern Standard Time. Great. Oh, Mary, great. Arts Live Song Room has made a lot of lessons free. They do great stuff. Thanks, Sam. It's Jennifer. What's good music notation software during recording live and screen recording? Any music notation software is totally fine. If you have nothing yet, um, I'd probably start with NoteFlight. It's nice and straightforward to use. It's an online format and it, so it works on every device um, and it's great for the kids if you eventually want to do it uh, with that. Uh, Roz, yeah, great question about the dynamics activity. Each student had a different side. Can they see others? Wouldn't they just copy? Quite possibly. And this is where you would decide whether that's going to work as a format for you or not work. When I designed that, I actually designed it with in-person teaching in mind. Not So you'd be in the classroom and they'd all kind of completed at the same time. Uh, and it wasn't really for uh, the remote learning um, situation. And then I remembered it as an example last night. I was like, I really want to show some examples. Oh, that's right. I made this thing. So yeah, you could totally just, um, if you're using Google Classroom, you can set it up so that you create your one slide activity and then every student gets their own copy of a separate file to, um, you know, to use. So, yeah, you can do it either way. Thank you, Mary, Megan, Catherine, Emma. Thank you, Deanna. Great. Yeah, okay. Um, Adele's asking, did I make my presentation in slides or Canva? So, Adele, for this one today and actually for all of them, I, I always use Keynote on my Mac, but... 
I get the images from Canva. So I go into Canva, I look for the image that I like and I download it with a transparent background and then I put it into Keynote. Um, so that's the way I'm working. Um, oh, hello, dog. Joshua, would you mind just grabbing her? Or Jamie, whoever that is there. Um, yeah, so that that's just the way. If you can walk past, no one's looking. <laughs> Um, that's the way I'm doing these ones. Uh, personally, I just prefer my my presentation files when it's a big thing that I spent many hours working on. I like it to be Keynote living locally on my Mac. However, I do pull in things from other places uh, from time to time. I just don't love the idea of it living online in Canva or Slides because, uh, you know, I get worried. <laughs> Hello, Ella, says Megan. <laughs> um yeah, I I think every webinar, the person who's saying about have I heard about Jam Kazam, I have heard of it. I have not played with it. I have not had a chance to do that. I think it's been mentioned in every single webinar I've run. Please report back, have a go and report back and tell me. Um, apparently it's great. You've said apparently it's great for overcoming latency issues. Um, I'm really sceptical, but I'm happy to be proven wrong. I am really sceptical about whether that's actually going to be a thing. <laughs> anyway, Julia's asked, is Canvas the same as Canva? No, they're totally different things and very easy to get them mixed up. Someone actually asked a question about Canvas and someone replied in a Facebook group and I saw someone replied thinking they meant Canva. Canva is a graphic design tool, online graphic design tool where you can, it's got a massive library of clip art images and fonts and all this. And to be honest, before all of this happened, coronavirus stuff, the thing that I was working on is a course in how to use Canva as a music teacher or any teacher actually. Um, I will get back to that. It's about like a third done. And then I had to kind of abandon things and switch and pivot. Um, Canvas, on the other hand, is a learning management system where you would store and share your resources for students. So they're two totally different things. They just happen to have similar-ish names. Okay, great. Martin's going to get Seesaw for me. Yeah, thanks, Ali. I meant to put that in, actually. Um, Seesaw has a Facebook group and Google Classroom has a Facebook group set up which is specifically for music teachers. So... Seesaw for music teachers and Google Class for music teachers. Go and just go and, yeah, go and join those groups. They're really useful because those people are specifically discussing those tools. Um, Louise is asking about how to do the whiteboard. Actually, I, I probably said it wrong, Louise, in Screencastify. It's, it's not really a whiteboard function. It's an annotation function. So when you are showing... If you're showing a slide on the screen, uh, which is blank, let's say you're showing your Google slide and it's plain white, you can grab the annotation tool in Screencastify and draw on that. You could also be showing a photograph or an image of any kind and draw on that. But if you happen to show a white slide, that will give you the, the whiteboard effect, if you know what I mean. So it doesn't have that built in, but you would just bring up a white slide to be the whiteboard. Um, Flipgrid, on the other hand, does have it built in. You would actually choose whiteboard and then draw on it and stuff. Uh, Deanna, uh, Deanna, the PD certificate link, I'll, I'll grab that if Martin hasn't already. I'm scrolling down still. Yep, Ella, Ella is learning to scat. You're right. <laughs> Thank you, Calliope. Excellent. Uh, uh, Julia, yeah, um, sorry, I'll, I'm, I'm just going to work down in order. And uh, Yes, um, Julia, Judith is clarifying to, to Anne that you can share and save um, the link to an Incredibox composition, absolutely. Uh, sometimes if you want to see the whole thing and save it offline, that's when I would suggest the screen recording and that's the only reason. Um, and Christina wants to join the New Zealand group if you're from the US. I'm sure Martin doesn't mind, but I won't speak for him. <laughs> Julia, the, are the images free on Canva? Okay, so there's a few things um, I'll just say in the answer to that question is when you join up for free uh, in normal times, let's forget coronavirus times, but in normal times, um, a free account on Canva gives you access to a, a whole stack of stuff and then there are premium images. 
Um, having said that, last December they opened up an educator account and you do need to apply for this. So you set up your free account first and then you fill out the form, which if you just Google Canva for education, it will come up. There's a form that you fill out and they approve you. You kind of have to prove that you're a teacher and that you teach at a school. Um, they tell you what they need to see. And then once you have that, then you get access to what is usually their pro account. So that opens up a whole heap more images um, and lots of other features that are not part of the free account. Then having said that, I just saw like a few days ago, they sent an email out saying they've opened up all of the premium images now as well for users of the pro and education accounts, I believe. So I think at the moment everything is free, everything. But I'm just not sure if that's going to be forever. So just know that at a point it might get to the stage where they say, no, we're back to premium again. Great. Okay, fab, fab, fab. Louise, fab, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Yep, yeah, the the drawing thing. Yeah, give it a go. Oh yeah, Alison, I'll, I'll just post some links in while we're all talking here. Um, if I can find them quickly, I have a, a document of links for myself. I'm going to give you the direct link to the page where you can get to those free lessons. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes, I'll tell you about that in a second. <laughs> this is the Musical Olympics one. Hooray. So excited about that. Um, ditto to Deanne, Deanna's comment. Oh, you have your thing already. Okay, good. I'll, I will post it in anyway. Great. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Christina Brumman. Do you know if Loom will screencastify audio from SmartNote? No, it won't do that. Um, this is where you'd need to level up and get a different software program. So I probably didn't say that actually in the webinar. So Loom and Screencastify can record audio that's coming out of a browser tab only. I don't know if it's still an option, but in the olden days, <laughs> I haven't checked this for a while, in the olden days, you used to be able to open up your smart notebook in their online version. I don't know if you can still do that. It's a little bit less featured. If you can do that, it would be possible, but I, I'm suspecting that's not going to work. If you want to record the audio of a standalone software application that's on your laptop, i.e. Smart Notebook or Sibelius or GarageBand or um, anything that's not online, Screencastify and Loom don't do that. Now, I think that um, – I think they may – I have a really niggling feeling that in the back of my head that Loom might do that on a Mac only and only if you're using the downloadable version of Loom, not the, the Chrome extension version. That all sounds really complex, but um, it, it may kind of do that. But separate to that, this is where I use different software. So if I want to do that, it's, it's getting a bit more involved and I use um, ScreenFlow on my Mac to do that because it just has lots more options and ScreenFlow re will record anything on your computer, audio, video, my voice, any combination of those things. Um, if you're on a PC, Camtasia would be the one to check out. And if you are looking at those kind of leveled up options for software, it's really worth, if you're at a school, it's really worth asking the school, do they have a license for either of those things? Because I know, I know for a fact that some schools and districts actually have like a multi-seat license for Camtasia. It's, Camtasia is not that cheap. Um, so just go and ask your school, do we have a license for Camtasia or for ScreenFlow? Or if you want to purchase it yourself personally, then that, that's another thing. ScreenFlow is not too expensive. That's around 100-ish US dollars, I think. Um, I'm going to pop the link in for the AD certificate in case Corona Music just always get my Sharona in my head at the moment, <laughs> my Corona. All right, just going back through. Leanne, thank you. Perspective is everything at the moment. I agree. I think the kids really want, will want to see you in any shape or form at the moment. I really do think that. 
um, especially if they can see your face. I know some teachers are like, you know what, I'm just not going to show my face on the video. I'm just going to do everything with only my voice. I think it's where your face every now and again. They really do want to connect with you. They love it. And you'll find the same, I reckon. I've seen comments from teachers who are finding the same, seeing their students submit videos to them. They get all excited about, oh, so nice to see my kiddos. <laughs> so there you go. So, Kim, how did I choose Midnight Music for my website name um, and the business generally, really? Uh, basically, when I first started the business up, I was doing a huge variety of stuff, not really what I'm doing right now. And a lot of it was copying and arranging work. And when you do a copying job for anyone, <laughs> the first question you ask is, when do you want it done by? And the answer is always yesterday. Um, so you're always working on really short deadlines. And uh, because I was doing that work around a full-time day job, um, I was always working into the night. And the other reason was that I wanted a name which was sort of generic-ish because I didn't, I was doing a variety of things and I, I didn't know quite what to concentrate on. And eventually I ended up doing this. And I have uh, been considering whether to change the whole business name to something different, something a little bit different. Um, anyway, but then again, everyone knows the name now. So I don't think it matters. Your, your business name doesn't always have to say what you do, like Apple or Google. <laughs> so I, I think it's just going to stay Midnight Music. Deanna, yeah, Microsoft Teams has a whiteboard and you can do that sort of thing in OneNote um, as well if you've got the Microsoft kind of access stuff. Um, Adele, the notation font for Word, yes, there are a few. Um, someone's going to remind me. I feel like it's called Bark. Bark font is one of them. There's a few. If you actually Google music notation font, um, I don't really use them, to be honest. I... Personally, if I need to put a screenshot, if I need to put notation into a Word document, I create it in my notation software and take a screenshot and put it into the document. It's far easier to do that, I find. And then if it's a very short rhythm, like it's one measure of four beats, I will actually use individual notation images. And I made my own set of those, which I've shared on my website. And I'll pop the link in for anyone who wants that um, to use those. But it's essentially separate PNG files, so one Quaver, one Crotchet, and you can just, um, you know, use them as you need to and pop them together. So that's the way I approach it. I just, if it's more involved, I'll do the notation software. And if it's less involved, I'll use separate images. But I wouldn't use Word. I would, I would go back to using Slides or Keynote or, you know, whatever it is, presentation software. <laughs> Uh, da, 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 da. Um, the question about does Camtasia do more PC than a Mac? Yes. So Camtasia it was always for PC only and Mac had ScreenFlow and there are two separate companies that make those programs. And the history is that ScreenFlow became so big for the Mac users that Camtasia, um, this is what I'm sure, I'm, I don't know for sure, but this is what it looked like. Camtasia decided they better bring out a Mac version of Camtasia for Mac users so that they weren't losing that share of the market. However, the Camtasia on Mac that they produce is not the same as the PC Camtasia, at least the last time I looked at it. Everybody that I know that has a Mac just uses ScreenFlow and then if you're on a PC, everyone uses Camtasia. Um, and the difference in price is quite big. So ScreenFlow is around 100 US, 120, something like that. Camtasia is about 300 and something. Last I looked, it could be more. Make sure you're getting the education discount if you're going to buy one of those. Uh, okay, just checking through Kath, um, hi, Kath. <laughs> We're talking tomorrow. <laughs> uh, running a Google Meet, I like to play samples on my computer, but it doesn't sound right to the kids. I don't think that there is a way to do that in Google Meet. Um, in Just to contrast that, in Zoom, uh, there is an option for you to have an audio file on your laptop and actually ask uh, Zoom. Did I say the right word? Zoom. I get, I'm, uh, my mouth is getting mixed up with Zoom and Loom lately. In Zoom... 
you can share, go to the share screen function and choose to share computer audio sound only. And that will play the sound better for the kids at the other end more natively. I don't believe Google Meet has a limit, has, has a, an option for that. Yeah, okay. Uh, Martin's just said the same thing. If I read on, I would have seen that. Yes. Zoom will do that, but Meet does not do that. <laughs> um, be, and the reason they're sounding it, make they're hearing it and it sounds dodgy to them is because they're hearing it coming out of your laptop speakers and going back into your laptop microphone. So it sounds kind of crappy. The slightly better way, showed this yesterday was would be maybe to use a bluetooth speaker and play it that way it's still not going to sound great though to them it'll be okay just okay how do you get the free for educator in loom um i don't know about that i think so i think trish i think how it's working at the moment just uh you personally can sign up for loom and they've lifted restrictions on the account maybe anyway for general users I'm not sure about that though I think that for educators it needs to be done through your school so your your you set up through your school account um for through your school or district if you know what I mean kind of like the way that your school or district would sign up for Google Class on your behalf and then you get to use it with your school email address not sure <laughs> Amy had a play with Flipgrid and sent a short video of me with new guinea pigs. Awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. Great. Thank you, Nikki, Trish, Kath. Exactly, Jenny. That's what I said. Yes, exactly. Don't You don't need to do everything, all the things at all once. Yep. <laughs> you love the name. Okay, don't change the name, I'm guessing, from that, the, the business name. <laughs> Uh, yes, Julia, the students need to have a f access to a Flipgrid. They need to log into Flipgrid. You, they do not need to set up an educator login. That's for teachers. But when they um, when they go to your topic and go to record a video, if they're not logged in already, it will say, do you want to log in with your Google account or your whatever, your whatever. As a school, you can set up their access for them or they can kind of do it themselves. Um, yeah, I, I will double. I will double check on the best approach for that. But they do need to log in. You, you either log in really through Google and a Gmail account or a Microsoft um, account. It's a Microsoft tool, so if you're at a Microsoft school, they'll kind of have access already. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so many educators are in the up in the late hours. Agreed. <laughs> um, Jennifer, hopefully you got the link for the notation. It's just above your comment there. Um, great. Thank you, Laura. I couldn't remember the names of the, um, the the fonts and stuff. Oh, the stick notation. So that one, the stick notation, I made that in, well, I use Keynote, but you can do it the same in slides or PowerPoint. Um, the stick notation, the, the crotchet quarter note stick is literally from the shapes menu, choose line, make it black and make it the right thickness. And then the joined up quavers, the you know the, at the eighth notes, uh, are literally three sticks that I <laughs> made into that shape. <laughs> so that that's what I actually talk through in a different training that I have on this page. Let me just I'm going to just pop a link to a free training page, and you'll see. Da, 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 I'll just see where it is. Um, the one that's called Create Your Own Awesome Teaching Resources, I actually talk about it in there. So on this free training page, just scroll down, there's a thing called Create Your Own Teaching Resources, whatever it's called. Uh, all right, I'm going to wind up shortly, but oh, <laughs> Martin's giving us stats from the chat window. I'd love, I'd love to have seen that. Wow. 287, 600 messages sent in chat roll. Wow, that's awesome. Thanks, Kathy. Yes, I'll see you tomorrow. Javier from Colombia. Thank you. I'm glad it was all good. Uh, Michelle's saying use your e Gmail address and they send it automatically. Not sure that, what that was in reference to, but great. <laughs> glad. Thank you. How are things in Colombia? I'm not sure how locked down things are there. I haven't heard. Thanks, Eloise. 
<laughs> Martin says hello from New Zealand. Even I can work that one out. Great. Oh, thanks, Alfreda. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, flat. Um, flat is good. Uh, flat, uh, for basic things, you can use the flat. Um, cr- not, it's not a Chrome extension. It's a an add-on, a Chrome add a, a Google add-on. So if you are in Google Docs, there's an add-on which is allows you to create notation with the flat notation program inside your Google Doc. That's kind of useful. Um, I've found that it's best for very simple things. If you're wanting more complex stuff, it's not so good. And, yep, there are fonts that you can buy. Alfreda's got a a name of one there. Thank you, guest 3485. Zoom, better audio playback quality. Yep, I... I'll tell you what, um, Louise in Dubbo, (laughs) I'm just going to send you to a page where you can download my slides from yesterday's webinar or even the day before's webinar because I've got screenshots in that slide presentation of exactly what to do in Zoom and it's got where to click and all that sort of stuff. Checking in on the YouTube comments, I haven't done that. Um, Nan and Octavio from Honduras and Brian, thank you. Yeah, Brian's going to explore on the school holidays. Excellent. Um, what did I just say? The webinar from yesterday. Oh, yeah. Is someone doing that? Mark, you're in there already doing that. <laughs> I can see you. someone's in the document. So if you go to that, Link, who was that? Was it Louise? Louise in Dubbo? Um, I've lost the comment now. Kim says we rock. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Louise in Dubbo. Yep. So that link that I've just posted, the replay link for yesterday's webinar, head there, download the copy of my slides, and you'll just have to scroll through a few pages and you'll see that there's some Zoom settings. There's screenshots where to click and what to turn on and off. There's like four different ones in there. Easier than saying it um, verbally. Thank you, Kim. Alfreda, Alfreda's sharing another font. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks, Marilyn. Oh, chat notes. Yep. I I can include, it, they won't be on the video themselves, but I can include a, what do you call it? Like a transcript chat. It comes out looking just like a plain chat, uh, not plain chat, a plain text document. And I said yesterday, it kind of looks like a... Um, <laughs> <laughs> like a transcript from a court case, you know. <laughs> so it's got the name of the person and then anyway, if it's useful, I will include that. I may need to remember to do that for yesterday's one as well. I'm making a note for myself. Text doc of chat. Yeah, someone on Monday said it would be quite useful to see too. Uh Kathy, yeah, that's Kathy's question. Great. Michelle, thank you. I know I will miss seeing you at Music Ednet too. Yeah, I'm a bit sad that they got all um, all, all cancelled. Well, most of them. I think we're postponing one at this stage or are trying to postpone one, the Sydney one. Joy, no mad pad at, at all. Um, Joy, the one that I think is the best option, it's not the same because it doesn't do video, but um, the best one is called SampleBot. And SampleBot does some better things than MadPad actually did, but... It's it doesn't do the video part, but it's still awesome. Really, really worth. It's a paid app, but it's really worth um, checking out. I've just popped it in the the window there, the link. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, uh, Dench, Dench, Dench. And what about Note Flight? Um, I'm not sure what that was in reference to. Note Flight's great. <laughs> If you want my opinion on Note Flight, Note Flight is great. <laughs> yeah, Note Flight's great for a notation. Thank you, Judith. Yeah, the Olympics. I think that'll be cool. Thanks, Alfreda, for sharing all those links. I, I should do a roundup post actually of notation. Um, no, what do you call it? Fonts, I think, at some point. I, I, I've sort of got one going, but I think it needs some uh, fleshing out a bit. PD certificate, Samantha, uh, it's midnight.com.au forward slash Corona Music is the link. I've posted it a little bit further back in the chat. 
I'll I'll just pop it in again. Corona music. <laughs> this is actually the link to the form itself. Bye, everyone. Bye, Martin. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I will wind up too. May the Easter Bunny hop in with massive loads of chocolate and thanks. Yes, that would be nice. Dark chocolate. <laughs> I'm hoping the Easter Bunny brings dark chocolate. <laughs> Yeah, it's been so brilliant having Martin here. The first one, I, I did a, a sort of a kind of a private webinar last Friday, private as in it was for teachers in Victoria where I live in, in Australia. Um, it still had like 500 people on it and it was only me, no Martin, and, and then I was like, I really have someone helping out with the chat. Um, it, it wasn't bad. It just meant that I had to answer questions for a long, long, long time at the very end, um, whereas Martin gets to take care of stuff as we go, which is really good. Thank you, Becky. I loved seeing everyone in Texas too. I hope we can all get there next year. I was just saying earlier, the call for papers has um, just been announced, so I'll be getting mine in and hope to make it there. Um, the link for the, yep, the link. I'll, I'll post the links for the previous two days' webinars. I think I did post it earlier. This is for yesterday's one. It was – oh, no, that's yesterday's one. Maybe I did the wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> I think I did, actually. Uh, hold on, hold on. I've got all the links on the page here. This is for the Ensemble one. That's the one I did on Monday. And then I think I did separately already the studio one. So that was for band, orchestra, choir. Julia says only once a week, setting only one task per week is enough. Yeah, maybe. Um, and it depends on the task. Some people are doing really quick and easy tasks. So that choice board idea, you could have a choice board which is a tic-tac-toe board and maybe say to them, um, you need to do at least one per week, uh, but if you want to do more, you can. And after a couple of weeks, they might get to blackout stage where they've done all of them. Or you can say, by the end of two weeks, you need to have completed three in a row. Or it just really depends on the age of the kids, how involved the task is. And, you know, like some people are doing super simple tasks like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a super simple one, like here's a rhythm, go and, um, go and play this rhythm on a, a shaker that you know that you've got in the kitchen something that shakes in the kitchen and it could be like a two measure rhythm so that's going to be quick quick to do as opposed to uh go and interview someone about the history of their music playing or instruments or something i don't know maybe that's more involved yeah just depends and i also think it's worth asking your school what the expectations are because i think I think the pattern that I've seen happen is that the school says, yep, we're going to do this. All the teachers are going to be posting as much work as we did when we were all together in the school building. And um, some schools are even saying that you'll log on at the, the kids will log on to talk to you at the same time as their classes. And then I think after about four days, they all go, well, that's not working. That's ridiculous and too much. It's just too much. The kids are overwhelmed and the parents are overwhelmed because don't forget the parents have to kind of guide the kids, even if they're older kids. And the kids are overwhelmed because all of the teachers, rather than them, I was thinking about this this morning, rather than them going at nine o'clock to music and they see the music class and they don't think about music before that, they do the music class and then they go off to maths after that, you know, or literacy class, something else. And they're just thinking about the one thing at a time. I'm guessing in the online remote learning home situation, they get stuff from all the teachers all together, maybe. Not always, but maybe. They might get in Google Classroom, five different teachers might post assignments at once. Even though they're not required to do them all at the same time, it, that would be just overwhelming, seeing all those things simultaneously. So I think you've really got to dial things back. And that's another reason why the choice board thing is is not a bad approach because you can say this is your work for the next two weeks or four weeks or that case, that one that I showed of Joe's, which was handwritten, I think that was about six weeks worth of material and it, it's just like here's the thing, do this by this date, this by this date, this by this date. So you're not giving them new things every single day. That's my two cents. <laughs> 
All right. I'm going to sign off before my voice goes. And I do have to do another um, online meeting this afternoon and need to get some lunch before then. So thank you so much, everyone. The chat window will be open for a little while. I cannot guarantee that I will answer questions that appear in the chat window after I sign off. I may get back to it later today and answer at which time you may not be on by then, but um, if you've got questions, hit me up on my Facebook page is, is a fine thing. Um, I'm in both of those Facebook groups that I mentioned. You can tag me in a post if you'd like me to answer something there. If you want to put it out to the group, but also tag me, that's totally fine too. Thank you, Josie. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Julia. And goodbye, everyone.